Bonjour and bienvenue to the podcast you are currently listening to. Je m'appelle Ben Clark and I host the podcast Battle Royale, where my best friend Eliza and I pass judgment on all the kings and emperors of France from Clovis to Napoleon III. All 71 of our monarchs are locked in an imaginary dungeon awaiting our judgment. Those who we deem to be the creme de la creme will go through to the Battle Royale tournament and compete to see who is the most majestic, fabulous, and irresistible despot of them all. Join us on our macabre adventure from the Dark Ages to the French Revolution and help us decide who's ahead and who's headless at Battle Royale French Monarchs, wherever you get your podcasts. Hello everyone, and welcome back to the History of Africa podcast. I'm your host, Andy. Last episode, we looked at the tumultuous year following the death of the 40-year Shantahene Kwakojoa, the massacre in Kumasi committed by the Adumhene, and the election of a new Ashantahene, Kofi Kakari. Kakari immediately purged the military of any elements he saw as disloyal, and abolished several unpopular but financially necessary taxes, plunging the empire into a state of financial decline. This episode, in what has become a recurring trend, tensions between the British and Ashanti will once again escalate to a fever pitch, leading to the third, and most consequential, Anglo-Ashanti War. Season 3, Episode 22, The Elmina Controversy As we approach the end of this season, I've personally been filled with an inexplicable dread with each passing episode. I love covering Ashanti history. It's been by far my favorite topic to write and speak about on the show. But, as I've been not so subtly foreshadowing in the recent episodes, we're starting to enter the swan song period of the Ashanti Empire. And, with a few exceptions, this same period, the late 19th century, represents the swan song of basically every pre-colonial African civilization that we'll cover on this show. This episode, which will set in the year 1872, is when the fortunes of not only the Ashanti Empire, and not only the entire African continent, but the entire world begins to shift. Starting in 1872, we have now entered the twilight years before the single most infamous time in African history. This is, of course, the time period known as the Scramble for Africa. The approaching Scramble episode has been the cause of my dread throughout the entire podcast series. For those of you who have somehow never heard the term Scramble for Africa before, the Scramble for Africa refers not to a single event, but to a roughly 40-year period of intense European imperialist expansion in Africa. If you do a web search for the term Scramble for Africa, you will primarily encounter a pair of maps. One is labeled with a year, usually between the years 1878 and 1884. This map features, with varying accuracy, a map of Africa filled with hundreds of independent kingdoms, empires, and republics. Then, next to it is a map labeled some year between 1910 and 1920. On this map, the hundreds of kingdoms have vanished. In their place, they have been absorbed by enormous colonial empires. France, Britain, Germany, Portugal, Spain, and shockingly even Italy and Belgium. Looking at maps like these, it's abundantly clear that something happened around the 1870s to dramatically upset the traditional balance of power between European and African states. Perhaps no other region more dramatically demonstrates the shift of power between European and African states than Ghana. Remember, just a few years earlier, in the Second Anglo-Ashanti War, the Ashanti handily defeated the British in a relatively convincing manner. While there was no spectacular battle comparable to Insamanko, the Second Anglo-Ashanti War showed the weakness of the British position in Ghana. Namely, the British army struggled to resupply its soldiers. While the failure of British medical science to adequately treat or contain malaria and smallpox outbreaks caused considerable attrition. We've seen the Ashanti prove themselves over and over again in this series to be equal, if not superior, to the British on the battlefields of West Africa. But, despite this record of success, the tide will turn dramatically in the following years. But before we continue any further, let's rewind. What am I talking about with this third Anglo-Ashanti war? Last we left off, the Ashanti under Kwakojoa had seemingly resolved their border disputes with a convincing victory. The British were reeling. They were on the verge of losing control over their zone of influence in Ghana altogether. Independently, in Mankasim and Accra, two separate councils of Ga and Fanti respectively met and discussed the future of their relationship with the British. The men on these councils, who were primarily from the bourgeois class of non-noble merchants, were terrified of Ashanti expansion, and worried that the failure of the British in the Second Anglo-Ashanti War signaled that the British were incapable of providing adequate protection against future Ashanti incursions. 
In 1868, they formed two separate local governments, the Fonte Confederation and the Acre Republic. We've been talking a lot about these states in what has turned into a monstrous three-part series of premium episodes all about the Fonte Confederation, its goals, leaders, successes, shortcomings, and ultimate failure. If you want to check out this three-episode series on the Fonte Revolution and the Confederation that it birthed, please check them out by supporting the show on patreon.com slash historyofafrica. To summarize in much less detail, these states were not anti-British per se, and even made strong overtures of alliance to the United Kingdom. They sought to maintain the general colonial relationship with the British, but more in line with the self-government enjoyed by places like Australia or Canada. However, part of this push for colonial autonomy was their goal of reducing their reliance on the British for economic and military power, so that in the case of a future Ashanti invasion, the Fanti and Ga would be prepared to defend themselves, and not just pray that the unreliable British kept them out. This push for self-reliance was a major threat to the British position in southern Ghana. The British, for their own part, didn't really know how to react to the rise of these new republics. Some members of parliaments favored crushing these new constitutional states with force, viewing them as a rising threat to British influence on the Gold Coast. Others actually supported the new nations, arguing that they could reduce the burden of British military spending in the region while keeping coastal West Africa open to British merchants. By 1872, though, it was a moot point as both states would prove themselves to be paper tigers. To make a long story short, these states enjoyed basically no local support beyond a tiny minority of bourgeois merchants. At first, the states received some backing from local nobility and kings, but this eventually fell through as the merchants tried to secure their own power. And, of course, it was these local nobility and kings who, you know, possessed the clout to collect taxes, raise armies, and enforce laws. The federation was functionally useless. So, as the noble classes lost interest in the confederation projects, any real power that these states possessed collapsed overnight. By the end of 1872, the Fanti Confederation was once again a de facto British colony. The government of the Confederacy continued meeting well into the next year, but it was, for all intents and purposes, Model UN, debating meaningless documents and proclamations that nobody obeyed and nobody enforced. The Republic of Accra, on the other hand, just kind of faded out of existence after 1869. The failure of these South Ghanaian republics marked a point of no return in terms of British colonialism in Ghana. If anything, the failure of these states only served to legitimize and reinforce the Gold Coast dependency on the British. The factions in the colonial government that favored local self-rule were humiliated by this failure, and the faction that favored direct rule was vindicated. In 1869, the transformation of southern Ghana from a collection of autonomous but dependent local states into a true, directly ruled extension of the British Empire was now underway. The old system of indirect taxation and manpower levies were abolished. From now on, the once independent Asafo companies were now directly controlled by the British, and they were integrated into the British army as a regiment in the British West African Battalion. But the spark that would ignite war between the British and Ashanti was not linked to the failure of these republics. Well, I mean, it kind of was, but you know, we go into that in the premium episodes. Rather, the direct cause of war was an agreement between the British and other European colonial power in Ghana, the Dutch. By the 1860s, the Dutch colonies in the Gold Coast had become increasingly untenable as economic assets. The reliance and arms trade with the Ashanti continued to support a profitable venture for a few Dutch merchants, but apart from that, the colony was a financial black hole. At this point, Dutch forts in Ghana were expensive to maintain and not especially useful. The Dutch controlled a large chunk of territory in the west, the areas that had conquered during the Ahanta War. This area was actually quite stable and even profitable for the Dutch, as it hosted the main road to Komasi and as a result, the main artery of Dutch Ashanti trade. Then there was a scattering of isolated forts all the way up and down the coast. The largest, Elmina, proved to be a particular headache for the Dutch. During numerous periods of time, Fanti Asafos had tried to freeboot and seize the castle at Elmina, Sometimes they even succeeded. At one point, the Dutch basically had to pay a ransom to Afanti Asafo in order to get Elmina Castle back. The isolated nature of these forts made them difficult to defend, which further heightened the cost of repelling these attacks. So, the Dutch decided to make a deal with the British. The Dutch ceded to the British all of their forts east of Elmina. In return, the British traded all of their forts west of Elmina transforming the Ghanaian coast from a confusing patchwork of colonial sovereignty into a pretty straightforward system of two big blocks of land. However, this deal turned out to be disastrous for the Dutch. 
They and the British had not consulted the local people, whose national sovereignty was being traded around like Pokemon cards. Turns out, the predominantly Fonty population of a town called Comenda was very unhappy. Remember, the Fonty kings, including the King of Comenda, had originally surrendered their sovereignty to the British explicitly for protection from the Ashanti. Now, they were under the control of the Dutch. You know, the Ashanti's foremost ally and partner. How were they supposed to trust the Dutch to protect them from an Ashanti invasion? This resulted in rebellions aplenty, with the Dutch incurring great costs in finance, prestige, and human life just to retake this territory. While the Dutch won, and that's won in big quotes, the brief war, the rebellion proved to many in the Dutch government that their position in Ghana was just not worth the trouble. So, behind closed doors, the Dutch and British met to find a solution. In exchange for ownership of the island of Sumatra in Indonesia, the Dutch ceded the entirety of their Gold Coast colony to the British. Throughout this season, we've seen a total of six different European countries operating forts on the coast of Ghana. Now, after centuries, there is one. The British are now the only European power left in the Gold Coast. The Ashanti government, which had not been consulted in the trade, reacted with a combination of rage and terror. And when you think about it, it's not too hard to see why. From the very beginning of direct contact between coastal West Africa and Europe, when the Portuguese first landed and established Almina, nobody had ever truly possessed a monopoly on trade on the Ghanaian coast. But with one flick of a pen, the Dutch surrendered a monopoly in Ghana to the British. This was absolutely antithetical to Ashanti foreign policy. The theory behind Ashanti foreign policy since the empire's inception, and even then inherited from their old overlords, the Danchira, was to play European powers off each other in economic proceedings. If the British were too stingy with their prices on any given good, the Ashanti merchants could simply say, no thank you, and haggle for more competitive prices with the Dutch or Danish. Well, that was no longer an option. And that's not even to mention the strategic shakeup. Remember, during the Second Anglo-Ashanti War, the Ashantahene Kwakojoa's first and most important priority in the conflict was to send an army into southwest Ghana and keep the trade routes of the Dutch open, allowing for the arms trade with their Dutch allies to continue even during wartime. Now that the Dutch were gone and the British controlled all of their major ports on the coast, the prospect of the Ashanti getting completely locked out of the international arms trade was a frightening and even likely outcome. And this strategic advantage that the British now possessed was, arguably, not even the most outrageous part of the agreement. Remember, even with the immense expansion of European colonial power in Ghana, it was still incredibly rare for European powers to directly claim ownership over land and cities in the region. Usually, their de facto ownership took the form of leases and rental agreements, or in later years, protectorate agreements. Even as late in the 1870s, European powers on paper didn't technically own much of anything in Ghana. This includes the Dutch, who, at the time of their deal, didn't own a single mile of land on the Ghanaian coast. That land that the Dutch had seized from Ahanta in 1837? Remember, that had occurred only after the Ashantehene granted permission for the attack. From the Ashanti perspective, the Dutch were not colonizing anything, but were rather conquering the area for the Ashantehene in exchange for a right to use it. Perhaps the most famous example of this type of relationship involved the oldest European base in Ghana, Elmina Castle. Remember, the castle at Elmina actually predates the Ashanti Empire, and was built with the permission of the kings of Danchira, who rented out the land for the Portuguese in exchange for tribute payments. When the Dutch eventually took over this castle, and continued making rental payments to the Danchira. When the Ashanti surpassed and then conquered their former Danchira overlords, Ose Tutu claimed to inherit this ownership of Elmina, and of course, continued to collect rent payments from the Dutch in exchange for their right to use the castle. Now, this is where things get a little ambiguous. The Dutch had never officially accepted the notion, at least not since the rule of Ose Bonso, that they were paying rent to the Ashanti. Rather, they referred to these payments in internal documents as gifts to promote trade with the natives of the interior. So, did the Ashanti really have the right to claim overship over Almina? But that's not how Kofi Kakari viewed the matter. He viewed Ashanti ownership of Elmina as a non-question, something that was so obvious that it wasn't even worth considering. Gifts to promote trade? Yeah, right, dude. Those are rent payments. So, when the Dutch traded this land to the British, the Ashanti government strongly objected, claiming that the British had no right to occupy the former Dutch Gold Coast because, well, it wasn't really the Dutch's land to give away. 
Upon hearing Cockery's objections, the British government became hesitant to accept the trade. It had barely been a decade since their last defeat at the hands of the Ashanti, so the British were quite weary to provoke another war. To make the trade go more smoothly, the Dutch sent a diplomat, an African man named Henry Plange, to Komasi, ostensibly to convince Cockery to revoke his claims. When Plange arrived in Komasi, he found that Cockery was not at all willing to abandon his claim. So Plange got creative. He forged a document in which the Ashantahane waived all claims to Almina. This forgery was enough to convince the British, who went along with the trade. So, not only was the British monopoly over the Gold Coast threatening, it was also entirely illegitimate, based on a Dutch forgery. So far, our story has been pretty normal in terms of Anglo-Ashanti relations. The complex issue of sovereignty in Ghana, further exacerbated by the often shifting definition of who exactly owned a specific region and why they owned it, or what that even constituted, has been the principal cause of every clash between the British and Ashanti Empire that we've seen so far. So, the British acquisition of the Dutch Gold Coast was very plainly reopening the same can of worms. Cockery did not take this provocation lying down. But his response is a little bit puzzling. In Komasi, the Ashanti held a small group of European captives. This group was a strange and diverse composition of people, including a French merchant, a Dutch missionary, and a small group of Swiss missionaries. I've seen a few sources claim that the Ashanti captured these missionaries as a direct result of the British takeover of Elmina, but this is actually not true. These hostages were, in fact, taken before the controversy had even began, in 1869. These Europeans had each been working in the border region between the Ashanti and Daomi empires. Encompassing much of modern Togo, this region had once been under the control of Daomi, but for the last several decades had devolved into a sort of political no-man's land, but rather where almost every village or city was its own independent state. But in 1869, this changed. The Akwamu, the longtime Ashanti ally and now vassal, initiated a series of campaigns to extend their influence into this territory and, of course, received a great deal of help by an Ashanti army led by the general, Adu Beaufort. During these wars, the Ashanti accused the merchants and missionaries of aiding the Akwamu's enemies. So, upon achieving victory in his campaign, Adu Beaufort brought the Europeans back to Komasi in chains. Unsure of what exactly to do with the prisoners, Kakari ordered that the Europeans were to be freed from captivity, but that they were not allowed to leave Komasi. Imagine basically house arrest, but instead of house arrest, it's like city arrest. You can go wherever you want, as long as it's in Komasi. Even from the accounts of these captives, the government treated the missionaries and merchants pretty decently, giving them a humble allowance and providing them with free housing, albeit in one of the seedier districts of the city. At first, the Ashanti government tried to ransom off the prisoners for a monetary price. The Ashanti government was in a terrible financial state following Kakari's abolition of Kwakojoa's estate tax, so Kakari had to take every opportunity he could find to rejuvenate the royal treasury. Now, the British government didn't especially care about these captives. None were British, after all, so, like, why would they care? However, Kakari was politically savvy and stayed patient. He knew that even if the British didn't care, the French, Swiss, and Dutch certainly did. If the British continued to refuse to pay this ransom, this could cause an international incident between Britain and these other European countries. So, after a brief negotiation, the British folded, and agreed to pay 8,000 pounds worth of cowries for each captive, which, for all six captives, roughly equated a price of about 6 million modern British pounds. However, this deal was abruptly cancelled at the last minute when news reached Komasi of the British trade for Almina. All of a sudden, Cockery had a very different, much steeper demand for the hostages' release. He would return the hostages on one condition. The British gave up Elmina. This was never a demand that the British would realistically fulfill. Returning Almina to Ashanti sovereignty would be a disaster for them on multiple fronts. For starters, that entire trade with the Dutch would have been for nothing. The British had given up a decent amount of land in Indonesia for that deal. More importantly though, giving up the territory would further deteriorate the British's already shaky relationship with their allies in Ghana. Let's look at this from the perspective of the Fanti and Ga. If the British allowed the Ashanti to just annex Elmina, then who's to say they won't let the Ashanti annex Accra, Abra, or Cape Coast next? We're only a few years removed from the fall of the Fanti Confederation Accra Republic. And while those movements happen to fail, who's to say that the next version wouldn't be successful? So, better to avoid provoking any backlash from their allies altogether. 
the British refused outright. With the British refusal received, Cockery was left with no other option. Desperate to avoid a British monopoly over the coast, he mobilized his soldiers along the Pra River. War was seemingly just over the horizon. However, while Cockery was mobilizing for war, others in the Ashanti government were less confident. Notably, the young general Adu Beaufort stood firmly in the anti-war camp. He had just returned from a series of war where he expanded the Aquamu state, and by proxy Ashanti influence, deep into the southeast, conquering numerous small kingdoms and city-states of the Iwe, Guang, and Ga peoples. While you might expect this success in wartime would lead Beaufort into the pro-war camp, it did the exact opposite. For starters, Beaufort's success in the southeast made the British takeover of Almina a little less pressing. Many of the territories that Beaufort had conquered were on the coast. Now, none of these areas possessed any large cities like Accra, Cape Coast, or Almina. More importantly, there was no infrastructure that would allow the Ashanti merchants to import and export large quantities of goods through this corridor. However, these were all problems that could be fixed. They could build roads, ports, and other infrastructure to make this area rival Almina in importance. Particularly, the town of Porto Seguro, or Agbodrafo as the local Iwes caused it, was home to an old Portuguese harbor and port. With the right investment, Porto Seguro could become the next Elmina. To Otto Beaufort, investing in his conquered territory seemed like a smarter investment of resources than another costly and risky war with the British. Not to mention, there was always the question of if the Ashanti could actually, you know, win this conflict. During his campaign, Otto Beaufort had become acutely aware of the limitations of Ashanti military power. Since its foundation, the Ashanti army had been a primarily gunpowder-based fighting force. Typically, Ashanti guns were made by local artisans and weaponsmiths, whose models were basically modified European muskets. These muskets were typically on the cheaper end, as they were mass-produced in Europe for the intended exportation to West Africa. The quick adaptation of gunpowder allowed the Ashanti to keep pace pretty well with European models by importing relatively up-to-date firearm designs. However, during his campaign in the southwest, it had become clear to Beaufort that the Ashanti firearms were beginning to fall behind. The people of the southwest, unlike the Ashanti, had imported firearms from the British and French quite recently. The Ashanti, on the other hand, hadn't imported any new European firearms since their deal with the Dutch to send troops to Indonesia, which took place about 30 years prior. Even then, most of the army was using older models than that with most Ashanti firearms being based off of British muskets used during the Napoleonic Wars. During Beaufort's conflict in the southeast, the discrepancy in quality between European and Ashanti firearms became embarrassingly obvious. The European rifles loaded faster, consumed much less gunpowder, were more accurate, and had a much longer range. Despite ending in a victory, the southwest campaign ended up being far more costly for the Ashanti than anyone had expected largely due to the technological discrepancy between both sides. With these problems in mind, Beaufort believed that should war break out with the British, the Ashanti shouldn't just assume that they could win. In addition to Beaufort, there was one other very prominent member of the anti-war movement, the Ashanti Hema, Kakari's mother, Afwa Kobe. Kobe, in particular, adopted a more overtly moralistic mindset for opposing war with the British. In particular, Kobe was opposed to her son's taking of hostages. She thought that this tactic was underhanded, dishonorable, and even inviting to find retribution. Enraged by her son's escalation of tensions with the British, Kobe gave an impassioned speech in front of the Ashanti Manchiamu. Since old times, it has been seen that God fights for Ashanti if the war is a just one. This one is unjust. The Europeans begged for the imprisoned white men. They were told to wait until Adu Borfor came back. Then we said we wanted money. They offered and even weighed the money. How then can this war be justified? Taking all this into consideration, I strongly advise that the white men should be sent back at once so that God can help us. However, Cockery was not alone in pushing for war. In fact, some of the members of the pro-war party were so aggressive that they made Cockery look dovish by comparison. The most prominent member of the pro-war faction was, who else but the aging general, Amon Kwasha IV. Amon Kwasha argued that war with the British was not only a good idea, but a necessary one. In his view, 
Beaufort's recommendation of investing resources into the newly acquired southeastern territories was ridiculous. Why invest so much money that the government doesn't have into infrastructure in these new territories instead of just, you know, keeping the territory that they already had? Not to mention, it would not be in the Ashanti's national interest to begin conceding land without a fight. Compared to some other African nations, the Ashanti Empire invoked a greater degree of respect from European nations in terms of autonomy and expansion. When Europeans sent missionaries, merchants, or diplomats into Ashantemon, they asked for permission. They didn't just send them in. Unlike in other parts of Africa and Asia, Europeans didn't just seize land and ask questions later when dealing with the Ashanti. This was largely because they knew that the Ashanti could be easily provoked to war even by a small incursion. So European powers didn't make those incursions. If the Ashanti began rolling over at the British's request now, this would set a bad precedent. They would surely continue to expand and undermine Ashanti authority in the future. Amon Kwasha also had some more selfish reasons for advocating for war, however. For starters, every speech that the general made about the brewing conflict with the British strongly implied that he, and nobody else, would personally lead the Ashanti Empire to victory on the battlefield. This has led historians to conclude that Amon Kwasha's primary motive in pushing Kakri towards war was, in fact, his desire for personal prestige. Beaufort's recent wartime success had provoked a combination of envy and fear in Amon Kwasha. Envy of his younger counterpart's rising fame and success, and fear that his growing stardom could usurp Amon Kwasha's role as the preeminent military leader in Ashantemon. So, if he was to ward off this rising challenger, Amon Kwasha needed a grand victory, something like say, defeating the British. So, pushing for war with the British was not only a matter of policy for Amon Kwasha, but a matter of personal political survival. Despite the pleas of some of his contemporaries, Kakari ultimately chose to side with Amon Kwasha and the pro-war faction. In October of 1872, the Ashanti Man convened, and, after a triumphant speech by Amon Kwasha himself, the Ashanti government declared war with the British under thunderous applause. The Ashanti and British each began mobilizing for war. Join us next episode as the Third Anglo-Ashanti War develops from a series of promising victories into the greatest military and social catastrophe in Ashanti history. Thank you for listening to the History of Africa podcast. If you like the show and the free education we provide, then we would love it if you could support the show. You can do this through supporting us monetarily at patreon.com slash historyofafrica, providing the show with a rating or a view on whichever platform you listen on, or sharing the show with anyone who you think might be interested in learning more about African history. This episode is brought to you by our supporters on Patreon, including Naomi Kanakia, Ayo Fagbamie, Kevin Johnson, Morgan Blackmore, Sarah Penza, Tobias Tunglin, Dimitri, Emmanuel Zaudi, Alexander Travis, BB Milliam, Conrad Schwenke, Travis Bell, and Johnny Knowles, among others. Thank you all for supporting the show. It really means a lot.